The lecture you are about to see is part of our annual Allen Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the Department of Psychology for half a century until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who introduced new statistical techniques that are credited with changing the way modern psychological research is conducted. Allen also permanently enhanced the intellectual climate at UW Psychology by endowing the Allen Edwards Lectureship, which since 1999 has brought in an impressive list of renowned psychologists to the UW campus to interact with faculty and students. The lecture you're about to watch is one of a pair given back to back that matched a UW Psychology professor with a visiting researcher to talk about a topic of great public and scientific interest. Good evening. Let me introduce myself. I'm Sherry Mizumori, uh, Professor and Chair of the Psychology Department. And I have the distinct honor of welcoming you to this fifth annual Edwards Public Lecture um, Series. And I'm, again, I'm very pleased that you can join the Psychology Department as we celebrate one of our research specialties, and that is the development of behavior. Now, the Psychology Department seeks to take advantage of its unique collection of world-class researchers and instructors by facilitating interactions between the traditional subdisciplines in psychology, and by those I mean, for example, the clinical areas, developmental psychology, cognitive, behavioral neuroscience, social and animal behavior areas within psychology. We aim to foster greater synergy that leads to innovative solutions to large societal problems. This year's focus on the development of behavior exemplifies our department's unique type of interdisciplinary and comprehensive research programs that use multiple kinds of tools such as behavioral assessments, neuroscience methods, ethological analyses, and developmental theories to advance our understanding of the development of normal and abnormal psychological functions. And you'll see that such a comprehensive understanding is really essential to the development of effective educational tools and therapeutic interventive methods for our children. And so now what I'd like to do is move to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Liliana Langwa. I'll give you a little bit of background on her first. Uh, she received her PhD in 1994 from the psychology department at Arizona State University. Uh, she was then a research scientist in our department for the next two years, um, during which time she also taught at Pacific Lutheran University and Western Washington University. After that period, Dr. Langwa accepted a position in our department as an assistant professor in 1996. She was promoted to associate professor in 2002, and then most recently in 2009 was promoted to full professor. She is currently director of the Center for Child and Family Wellbeing, which is a newly established center in our department. Now, Dr. Langwa's research, as you'll hear, is one of the first in her field to use what is what she'll refer to as a bioecological model to understanding why some children respond to adverse conditions by developing adjustment problems or severe psychopathology while other children do not. This very high quality of her very important work is widely recognized by, in, in a number of forms, by her peers in terms of invited addresses. She's had consistent grant support from NIH. She's currently chair of the Scientific Review Committee and Advisory Council for um, one of the NIH um, Institutes, the National Institute on Child Health and Human Development, um, the National Studies, uh, Children's Study in particular. Um, she has been on editorial boards of some of the most prestigious journals as well. Furthermore, her work has captured the attention of the media multiple times. She's been interviewed by a number of media such as King 5 News, Time Magazine, MSN.com, Seattle Times, Post Intelligent, and so on. Further evidence of Dr. Lingua's work is of high relevance to the local community as she has worked with Seattle Public Schools as well as the African Communities Network. Now the amazing findings that you'll hear about tonight have been or stem from published work in really the very best journals in her field. And so with the, um, it's my, my pleasure, with great pleasure, I introduce Dr. Liliana Lingua. Thank you, Sherry, for that nice introduction. And thank you all for taking your time to be here tonight. We really appreciate you being here. Um, my colleague, Phil Fisher, and I are going to be talking about early experiences of adversity and how they shape children's self-regulation systems. Um, he's going to be talking about children who have experienced abuse and neglect and are in the foster care system. And I'm going to be talking about children who have experienced economic disadvantage and how that shapes their self-regulation systems. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the impact of economic disadvantage on children and then introduce a concept of effortful control, which is a key aspect of children's self-regulation, and talk about how parents and families play a role in the development of effortful control. 
and then um, comment a little bit about the implications of this research for intervention and policy. Of course, when we talk about economic disadvantage, we're talking about low income. Um, and just to put some um, numbers behind that, we, in our research, use the federal poverty cutoffs to identify families who are at or near the poverty um, level or considered in poverty. So the federal government has designated um, a $14,600 annual income as being a family in poverty if you're a family of two. In our research, that's a mom and a child. Um, and if you're a family of four, that's $22,000. So you can imagine the, what it would be like to live in the Seattle area or King County area on this income and the strain that's associated with that. Um, in fact, its economic disadvantage isn't just um, the low income. It tends to be associated with a whole host of other risk factors that children experience. Single parents are um, markedly overrepresented among families in poverty. Uh, families in poverty are more likely to move frequently, have residential instability, or be living in situations that are um, crowded or noisy. These families are more likely to experience negative life events, major negative life events, health-related um, events, hassles, daily hassles, car problems, job problems, whatever. There's more hassles. They are more likely to live in high-risk neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are characterized by high crime rates or that are just physically unsafe for children to be in. Um, they often have poor health care. Either they have access to less good health care or they don't access the health care they do have access to. And they're more likely to have parents with par mental health issues or substance use problems. So any one of these risk factors alone is associated with an increased risk for problems in children's social emotional adjustment, any one of them. But children growing up in low income settings are experiencing many of these, many of them at the same time, two or three or four, sometimes as many as eight risk factors at a time. And this accumulation of risk or burden associated with that is often called cumulative risk. And it is in this context that parents and families navigate the strain and stress as they parent their children and try to contribute to their well-being and their development. So our research is focused on understanding how this accumulation of risk might impact parents and families as they um, try to raise their children and contribute to their children's well-being. I want to say a little bit about what I mean by child well-being, because depending on your discipline or your field or your interest, you could take different indicators of well-being. We could be talking about physical indicators, uh, physiological stress responses, um, children's indicators of children's social or emotional adjustment or mental health or academic achievement. The important thing to keep in mind is these are not just correlated indicators of, of well-being. They're interdependent, that achieving well-being in one is very likely to be dependent on achieving well-being in the others. So it's hard to imagine a child having really good social emotional competence or academic achievement if they're suffering from physical ailments or poor nutrition or um, a great deal of um, stress. So it shouldn't surprise us then that when we look at the impact of economic disadvantage on children's well-being, that um, economic disadvantage touches on just about every indicator of a child's well-being. Um, children are, who are growing up poor are more likely to be rated as having poor health, as um, having a learning disability, demonstrating emotional behavior problems. They're much more likely to be held back in school, retained in gra a grade. Um, they're more likely to drop out of high school or to be expelled from school. This exposure to disadvantage does not only have widespread impact, but it has long-term impact. Experiencing economic disadvantage early in childhood predicts or has impact on uh, children's or youth adjustment all the way into late adolescence and early adulthood. So children who have experienced economic disadvantage early in their lives are likely to have higher men or higher likelihood of mental health problems they are, have a greater rate of adolescent births or teen pregnancies, and um, they tend to be or are more likely to be economically inactive by the age of 24, meaning they're either not in school or not working. Now, this early exposure to economic disadvantage follows an interesting pattern relative to other risk factors. That is, the early exposure to economic disadvantage early in childhood has a more pronounced effect on adult outcomes 
than for children who experience economic disadvantage later in their childhood or in, or in adolescence. Typically, when we are exposed to a risk factor, and for just as an example, a, um, parental divorce or the death of a parent or some other major stressor, the greatest impact is close in time to the event and then dissipates over time. But what we find in children's exposure to early adversity, chronic or major strain in their um, caregiving context and their upbringing, is that the impact of early exposure is greater on adult outcomes than of later exposure. So this leads to the first premise that we use in our work, and that what is one likely possible explanation of this is that this early exposure to adversity disrupts the development of key neurophysiological systems, and in our case, we're studying self-regulation systems, during a sensitive developmental period, the time when these systems are establishing themselves, and that these systems, once disrupted, will potentially have long-term and widespread effects on children's adjustment. Another interesting fact about disadvantage is that about half the effects of poverty experienced early in childhood are accounted for by something about the home environment, um, family environment. So these could be learning opportunities at home, but it also includes family relationships, residential instability, the parental mental health and substance use issues I mentioned earlier, and parenting. So this leads to the second premise of our work, and that is that parents and families will play a critical role in children's adjustment in low-income settings. And that if we can promote positive family context and parenting, during early childhood, we potentially can prevent uh, pervasive and long-term adverse outcomes in children experiencing early disadvantage. So in our research, we're um, examining a cascade model or a mediating model of the effects of low income where they are expected to increase the likelihood of a range of family stressors, which in turn might disrupt the quality of parenting and will shape children's self-regulation. Also, parenting is expected to shape children's physiological stress responses, which also will affect their cognitive development, their developing self-regulation. And this will have implications for children's social, emotional, and academic well-being. And so this is the model I'm going to talk about a little bit of our research that um, has been looking at it. But before I start, I'm going to um, try to define this construct of self-regulation. I'm sure when most people hear self-regulation, most people are thinking of self-control, stopping yourself from doing something. That's only half the picture. The other half of self-regulation is um, making yourself do something that you don't want to do, overcoming uh, lack of motivation or overcoming uh, a motivation to avoid something. So there's both stopping yourself from doing something or making yourself do something. Um, so um, as adults, we can imagine the challenge it is to get up in the morning and get to work or make yourself exercise or stop yourself from eating one more thing, uh, one more cookie, one more whatever. Uh, whatever it is we struggle with, that one more glass of wine, whatever. But with children, you can imagine the challenge of navigating complex social situations. And I'll give the example of kids arriving at school because it's, you, you, we can probably relate to that when we think about ourselves getting to work, but I won't embarrass adults by talking about getting to work. So think of a child starting the school day. They're supposed to arrive at school with lots of enthusiasm and energy and excitement for being there. We want them to want to be there and to show up pumped and ready to go, but when they arrive on the school ground, they're probably going to have to get in line and keep their hands off other people and not touch and not trip, um, get into the classroom, put away their things and get right to their morning work. The typical school day has children right to some morning activity. So we want them to be energized and focused and interested in what they're doing, but not so energized that they're bothering the kids around them or um, milling around the class. Um, and then the teacher might start her lessons and we want the child to be engaged and listening. And when she asks a question, we want the kids to answer that question. So they have to have that motivation and energy to answer. But don't yell out that answer. Please raise your hand. And be excited about giving the answer. But if I don't call on you, don't be disappointed. <laughs> put your hand down. Put your answer away. Overcome your disappointment of not answering that question. And find the energy again. Gear up again to answer the next question. Okay, so that. Um, approach and hold back is this constant titration of our energy, our motivation, our emotions to match the demands of a challenging or complicated situation. 
And we do that moment by moment every day. This isn't self-regulation, this isn't something you employ um, the first minute you wake up and then it's done for the day. It's moment by moment every day. And we all accomplish that based on our executive function. Executive function is the activity in our brain, in our prefrontal cortex, the front of our brain. Um, and it is a process, a cognitive process, that is monitoring most of the other activities in our brain. So our executive functions act as an executive, like in a business, where it is noting and monitoring and modulating and coordinating the input from our motor systems, our sensory systems, and importantly, our emotion systems. And a core aspect of executive function is effortful control, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on tonight. Effortful control involves attention, shifting, and focusing, and inhibitory control. Now, before I define those words, I want to say a couple things. Um, effortful control is um, the activity that is associated with effortful control is in this part of our brain called the anterior cingulate, and it's a place where there's input from emotion systems, from motor systems, sensory systems, and our executive functions, our cognitive systems, um, also are um, input there, and it's coordinating all those things. So it's a pretty complicated aspect of our brain and behavior stemming from that. And Phil is going to be talking a lot more about that, and I'm not an expert in this, so I'm going to pass on to him to talk about the neuroscience behind that. So I'm going to show you how we measure attention, focusing, and shifting, and inhibitory control first to put some meat on the bones of those definitions, and then I'll give you the definitions. Anyone who's taken an intro to psych class will have probably heard of the Stroop color word test. And in this test, I will ask you to tell me the color of the word that is printed there. Don't read the word. Tell me the color of the word that is printed there. So the answer is blue. blue. Thank you. But um, very good, you all passed. But um, you probably didn't realize the mental gymnastics you just engaged in to give me that answer. So when that word, red, appeared on the screen, you automatically read that. You read that without even thinking that you needed to read that or trying. You just read it. That's an automatic response to a um, predominant or dominant stimulus. The dominant stimulus is the word that's printed there. Um, but what I asked you, the correct answer, the preferred answer, was not in response to the dominant stimulus. It's to the non-dominant stimulus, which is the color of the word that's printed there. So you had to shift your attention away from what was dominant, what was obvious, the word that's printed there, and rather focus in on a non-dominant or a less obvious stimulus. You had to put away your automatic response, that is, telling me the word that's there, and rather produce a non-dominant response or a not automatic response, and that is the color of the word that the word is printed in. So you didn't know you did that, but I'll have you do it a couple more times, and you'll see yourself doing that now. And the correct answer to this is red. And OK, so you kind of can become a little self-aware of that process after I explain it to you. Of course, that works for adults because reading is automatic. You read the word without thinking about it. In young children, reading is not yet automatic. It starts to be automatic around seven or eight. Um, or, or maybe a little older, but um, in young children, they may be not even reading. And three-year-olds, we certainly don't expect them to be reading. So we've come up with, other people have come up with other ways of tapping this idea of effortful control in very young children. And one of them is this task day-night. We tell kids, or we ask kids, when does the sun come out, in the day or in the night? And they say, in the day. We say, well, we want you to do something silly. When you see the sun, I want you to say, night. When does the mood come out, in the day or in the night? And they say, in the night. We say, well, we want you to do something the opposite. So do something silly. We want you to say day when you see the moon. So when you see the sun, say night. And when you see the moon, say day. There we go. OK, so that's one way we do it. The other way, another way we measure um, this effortful control is um, with a task called monkey dragon. So we tell children, these are my friends, monkey and dragon. Monkey is a nice monkey. We're going to do what he tells us to do. Dragon is a grumpy dragon. We are not going to do what he tells us to do. So when monkey tells us to do something, you do it. And when dragon tells us to do something, you don't do it. Ready? Touch your nose. Touch your head. Good, thank you. So in this next one, you're all going to touch your head, toes, knees, and shoulders. No, just joking. 
Rather than put you through this exercise, I will show you this video of a child doing this other task called head, toes, knees, shoulders. And um, just as a quick setup, this child has already been practicing the opposite of touching head when we say toes and touching toes when we say head and touching knees when we say shoulders and shoulders when we say knees. So she's already been practicing that and I'm starting towards the end of the task so you can see her doing this. Now that you know all the parts, we're going to put them together. You're going to keep doing the opposite from what I say to do, but you won't know what I'm going to say. There are four things I could say. If I say touch your head, you touch your toes. If I say touch your toes, you touch your head. If I say touch your knees, you touch your shoulders. And if I say touch your shoulders, you touch your knees. Are you ready? Let's try it. Touch your head. Touch your toes. Touch your knees. Touch your toes. Which one? Touch your shoulders. Touch your head. Touch your knees. Touch your knees. Touch your shoulders. Touch your toes. Wonderful. Thank you for playing. So I love that little clip for a lot of reasons. One, you can hear the ambient noise in the background of a classroom. They're not even in the classroom. They're outside the classroom. But you can hear the potential for distractions around the child. Second, you can really see her thinking through what is the right response. A lot of the times you can tell she remembered the rule, but it took her a little bit to remember what she was supposed to do. So she even knew when she was wrong and self-corrected a couple times. That's a great demonstration of effortful control. So remember that it involves attention focusing, attention shifting, and inhibitory control. Let me just define each of those quickly. Attention focusing is being able to pay attention to the important information um, when there's a potential for distracting irrelevant information on the side. So in a classroom setting, that might be a child who has to focus on this worksheet they're working on while the teacher may be giving other instruction to another child um, and um, trying to stay focused. Attention shifting is shifting your attention away from distracting information or salient information to attend to what may be less salient but relevant. Um, one example, I'm going to give different um, categories of examples here. One example of attention shifting may be what we do in a stressful situation. Um, rather than focus on thoughts that might make us more anxious or aroused in a situation, we might be able to shift our attention away from those distressing thoughts and rather focus on more encouraging thoughts or um, thoughts that will help us get through a stressful situation. Inhibitory control is inhib inhibiting or stopping an automatic response or dominant response to give the non-dominant but correct response. So one example where we see inhibitory control might be a child on a playground who's playing a hearty game of tag and someone tags that child really hard and knocks them over. Well, there was no potentially malintent in that, but they may still be really mad and angry and jump up and their impulse may be to push back or be angry, but they're to inhibit that physical response and um, maybe give a more preferred assertive response like telling the child to not push so hard next time or something like that. So we use effortful control. We use these processes to manage our thoughts and emotions and behaviors all the time in order to match the demands of a situation. Why is effortful control important? At this point, it is um, a burgeoning area of research. Over the last 10 years, it's been identified as an important predictor or basis of a number of indicators of children's social emotional competence. So it's been shown to relate to better emotion regulation. When children are in frustrating or anger arousing situations, they tend to handle them better um, and, ha and become less aroused when they're higher in effortful control. It's been shown to relate to more empathy and social competence in children. Children who are higher in effortful control are more likely to have good perspective taking, to be responsible and assertive. Um, it's related to something um, called committed compliance, which is really a research paradigm, but is some of the early foundations of moral development. This is when we bring kids into a lab. We don't do this, but other researchers have brought children into a lab and given them some rule to follow or something they're not allowed to do. 
But then the adult leaves the room. As far as the kid's concerned, there's no one there who would know they broke the rule um, and no reason to really follow through because there's no clear consequence for following the rule. And children who are higher in effortful control are more likely to comply or with the rule or do what was asked of them. It's been um, shown to predict kindergarten readiness, academic readiness, and um, grades, co um, academic competence through the early school years. And it's related to lower emotional and behavior problems. And this is a robust and consistent association. So when you look at this array of um, indicators of social emotional competence and academic competence, you can see that effortful control appears to be a really important foundation or a foundation skill or ability um, that underlies children's well-being. It's also important because it's been shown to be a protective factor. So in older children, in children in the pre-adolescent and adolescent period, it's been shown to mitigate the impact of other risk factors. Children who are higher in effortful control are less adversely impacted when they're, they experience socioeconomic risk, neighborhood risk, family risk, and parenting. So this is just an example of what that looks at for, like from our research. Um, we looked at the effects of maternal risk factors and environmental risk factors. These are um, quality of the home environment and neighborhood risk as they related to um, internalizing problems, which is like children's um, depression and anxiety problems, and externalizing problems. These are behavior problems like aggression and conduct problems. And what we found was as the level of risk increased at time one, we saw kids' levels of problems also increasing over time when they were low in effortful control. Those are the red lines. Those kids were showing increasing problems when they were um, in a setting that had higher levels of risk. But the kids who were high in effortful control did not show this expected association of higher problems or growing problems in relation to risk. These kids tended to just have stable, low levels of problems across time. So effortful control is important because it relates to a whole range of adjustment indicators for children and it appears to be a protective factor. So it seems like a critical task of research is to understand how it develops in children who are growing up in high risk contexts. And if we can identify factors that promote the development of effortful control, those can be targets of preventive interventions um, for children in high-risk situations. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how effortful control develops in a typical, um, the typical trajectory, and then um, show you what the trajectory looks like for children who are in a low-income setting. We see the earliest signs of effortful control at the end of the first year of life and beginning of second year of life. And that's when we see individual differences in if infants' ability to shift their attention away from stressful things and focus on more soothing or calming things. So you can imagine an infant being approached by a stranger who thinks they're so cute and puts their face right in the infant's face. It's really adaptive for that infant to look away and look to their parent. That's one of the early signs of regulating emotion with attention shifting and focusing. But what we see in that three to five developmental period, the preschool period, is a dramatic increase in children's effortful control. So on tasks like the day, night, and head, toes, knees, shoulders, and monkey dragon, three-year-olds fail pretty miserably. And by the time they're five and a half or six, they're largely 100% successful on those tasks. So it's a really dramatic developmental increase at that period. And then effortful control continues to develop at a more moderate rate um, through childhood and adolescence and probably plateaus off somewhere early in adulthood. For children growing up in low income settings or in poverty, we begin to see already a difference in their effortful control at this very early three year old period. So this looks like a very small difference and it is, it's very modest but statistically significant in many studies. And then what we see is a divergence. Through this key developmental period, the children just don't attain effortful control at the same rate as children growing up in middle and upper income households. And that difference appears to continue through childhood. There may be a little bit of catch up. You see somewhat um, decreasing differences perhaps in adolescence, but still a statistical difference in levels of effortful control at this age, and then it um, tapers or uh, plateaus in adulthood. We have um, supportive evidence of this difference using EEG data or a study that, um, from Northern California that used electrical, measured electrical activity in the brain. And in children in middle and upper income settings, um, you see what you expect, concentrated activity in the brain in that prefrontal cortex. But in children in low income settings, you see what 
reflects uh, probably either a diffuse or inefficient pattern or maybe variations in patterns. In other words, not the concentrated activity you would expect. So our goal has been to understand what factors, particularly parent and family factors, help us understand those differences in income on children's developing effortful control. So remember, this was the model we're testing. And our first attempt at this model was to look at family and parenting predictors of the development of effortful control in pre-adolescent children. So in a sample of 208 to 12 year olds um, who um, were from the community, typically developing kids, we followed them for three years. We assessed them three times once a year and they um, represented socioeconomically diverse families. So we didn't recruit children who had any particular problem, but we recruited families to represent the whole range of income and had equal representation of income across um, the levels of income. So we had as many families in poverty as we did in upper income strata. And this is a really interesting age to, develop, to study development in children because this is when children are really developing some important skills that will carry them into adolescence. Their problem solving is solidifying, their coping skills are growing, their self-concept is falling into place, they, know what, they begin to know what they're competent at and what they're not competent at, and they develop their self-esteem. And social, emotional, and behavioral adjustment paves the way for their adolescent adjustment. So this is a really exciting age to study children. It's one of my favorite ages to study children. Unfortunately, it was a bad choice for studying the development of effortful control. So we studied effortful control by looking at um, the set of risk factors that uh, can map onto the risk factors I've been talking about as predictors of two things, um, an intercept of effortful control and a slope. An intercept reflects where the children started in the study. There are time one levels of effortful control at the start of the study. Their slope reflects their linear increases, the amount they either increased or decreased or stayed the same across the three years. So we can predict where they start and how they grow, either increasing or decreasing or staying the same. And um, we looked at all these risk factors in relation to where they started and how they changed. And the disappointing part was that all of our, many of our risk factors predicted initial levels, where kids started, but none of them predicted how they changed during this developmental period. So, for example, children who were in higher income families had higher initial levels. Um, parents, ch um, children who were in single parent families had lower initial levels of effortful control, and the other risk factors follow suit. But none of these helped us understand the variation in growth during this developmental period. And that just, it goes on and on. It's really disappointing. <laughs> but um, so for example, here we had acceptance um, in terms of parenting. Parents who were warm and supportive and accepting and affectionate towards their children had children who were higher in the initial levels of effortful control. Parents who were more harsh or rejecting or critical, who were inconsistent in their employment of um, limit setting, or who used physical discipline had children who were lower. But none of this predicted how kids changed in pre-adolescence. So, just to repeat that, we weren't predicting any changes, but many of our risk factors were related to initial levels. It may suggest that these risk factors had an impact, if they did, earlier in the developmental period, so that the differences we're seeing at time one were probably related to a potential impact earlier. And that it appears that if there are differences from earlier in childhood, they are holding steady during pre-adolescence. Um, We'd love to identify ways to build self-regulation in pre-adolescence. That's another direction we hope to go. But the direction we went was to look at the same type of model or predictors of the development of effortful control in preschool children. This is a sample of 103 three-year-old children. We assessed them twice, six months apart this time. Now, remember that the rate of change during this developmental period is much greater. So we could shorten the developmental period and still capture change. And this is, again, a, a, a um, families that represent a range of socioeconomic status. Because we only have two time points of data, there, we can't do the same analysis where we study initial levels and change, so we're just predicting change, the change in level from time one to time two, because those are um, dependent on each other. So in this case, almost all of our risk factors were related to relative changes across six months in effortful control. Kids who were in poverty had smaller increases in effortful control across six months. Kids with these various family stressors, negative life events, changes in their residential situation, maternal depression and family conflict, had smaller changes in effortful control or less growth um, across six months. 
And then we looked at parenting. And we studied four parenting variables. We had families, moms come in with their kids to our lab and we observed them interacting with their children and rated several parenting dimensions. The two that were related to the growth in equitable control were limit setting and scaffolding. So when parents came in our lab and set limits around their children's behavior around things that were inappropriate or dangerous or children acting out of control and they did so in a calm and appropriate manner and really consistently, um, their kids had greater rates of change or growth from time one to time two in their effortful control. And scaffolding is when moms do what we describe as stepping in and stepping out. Scaffolding is when the mom identifies that the child is sort of falling apart. They're either not doing well at the task we ask them to do or are getting emotional or upset and they need the mom's support and buttressing of their activities. So the moms were able to step in, soothe their child appropriately, and then step out and let their child operate autonomously, independently, when the child could do that. So knowing when to step in and step out, that's scaffolding. And that also led to greater increases in effortful control across six months. The important thing from these analyses is that when we looked at parenting, it mediated or accounted for the effects of poverty. That is, once we took these parenting behaviors into account, the effects of poverty on children's developing effortful control in these preschool children um, reduced in its effect size and became nearly uh, became non-significant, so near zero, in fact. So parenting is probably accounting for much of the effect of poverty on the development of effortful control in this age group. The next step in that model was to then also look at physiological stress responses um, as potentially mediating the effects of parenting. And we did this by measuring cortisol. And cortisol is an indicator of the neuroendocrine stress response system. It's a hormone that we can collect in children's spit. So we have children chewing on swabs or spitting into tubes, and we can assay their level of cortisol in their spit. And it's an, it's an indicator of their stress response system. In particular, we can get a sense of a child's regulation of their system by looking at their diurnal patterns of cortisol. So for almost everyone, cortisol levels are highest in your spit and in your blood and your body in the morning, um, soon after waking, and lowest at the end of the day. It drops off pretty quickly in the morning and then continues to taper off during the day. And we can look at this diurnal pattern and look to see if a child's showing a typical pattern. If they are, we can guess that their system is pretty well regulated. And um, if it's not, then there's probably a disruption in that system. And chronic strain, um, such as that associated with economic disadvantage, has been shown to relate to disruptions in the diurnal um, cortisol system or the pattern. And that's what we found in our data. So for the vast majority of our children, 85% of our sample, we saw this typical pattern where the levels were highest in the morning and lowest in the evening. Um, we also had this group of kids with very high levels of cortisol, but it also was tapering off during the day. And none of our risk factors predicted that. They're also a really small group, so we don't want to make too much of not predicting that, but we don't have much to say about them. But we did have um, a somewhat larger group of kids showing this flattened diurnal pattern. That is, they just weren't showing the elevations in the morning that we expect to see. And this is a good indicator of dysregulation in the system. Those kids or this pattern, this disrupted diurnal cortisol pattern was much more prevalent among kids living in poverty than those not in poverty. So kids in poverty um, showed this, 26% of our kids in poverty, I'm sorry, 23% showed this pattern of disrupted diurnal cortisol, um, diurnal cortisol whereas 6% um, of the kids not in poverty showed this pattern. And the kids who showed the disrupted diurnal cortisol pattern were also significantly lower in their effortful control. Now, because we collected cortisol data and effortful control data at the same time point, we can't say that one caused the other. But it's a hint that disruptions in the um, stress regulation system might be disrupting the development of effortful control. We're right now um, collecting data on 300 preschool kids with a whole range of income over-representing children in poverty and collecting their spit and getting their cortisol levels over four time points and we'll be able to look at which one tends to predict which and what the direction of effect might be. So just to repeat, poverty was related to a greater likelihood of having the disrupted diurnal cortisol, diurnal cortisol pattern. It was related to lower effortful control. And then we looked at parenting and it found this 
pretty interesting pattern. This is preliminary, but we're really excited about the possibility of um, understanding the different role of different parenting strategies in children's developing self-regulation systems. So it's the per parent's emotional tone and quality of their emotional relationship with their child that predicted the diurnal cortisol patterns. Whether parents were warm and accepting and um, supportive of their children versus negative, <coughs> critical, or rejecting of their children in um, our observations of them. Um, remember, it was the other two parenting variables that predicted effortful control directly. So this might imply that the things the mom does to scaffold and set up the child's behavior in a situation directly shapes their effortful control. And it may be that their emotional behaviors toward their child are regulating the child's stress response system, which is in turn um, influencing their effortful control. That's our hypothesis that we're going to be testing in our new study. So to recap, when you look at those two sets of studies together, the pre-adolescent children compared to the preschool children, it appears that there's a key developmental window to impact the development of effortful control. This may be a sensitive period of development of this important ability. In early development, at least in this preschool period, it appears that parents play a central role in accounting for the effects of poverty and family stress. And the parenting effects are, appear to be direct through scaffolding the child's behavior and indirect through their, shaping their stress physiology. And promoting parental warmth, scaffolding, and limit setting may promote better effortful control. So remember, this is that model. And I just wanted to comment on a whole nother line of research, which is looking at classroom context effects on effortful control. There's research looking at teacher-child relationships and different curricula that promote effortful control and social, emotional, and academic well-being in children. Um, I don't do that research, but I want to point it out for a reason. There are a couple really programs that have been shown to be empirically effective at promoting executive function or effortful control and emotion regulation in kids. One is Preschool Paths. Another one is called Tools of the Mind. You'll notice that in this Tools of the Mind, they promote teacher scaffolding in the classroom. And maybe that's parallel to the parenting scaffolding that we see. Another um, test of uh, school-based intervention was conducted by Shauna Tomini, who's a former undergraduate here at the University of Washington. She's at Oregon State University getting her PhD. And Megan McClellan, who was the woman doing the head, toes, knees, shoulder thing in the video. And they developed an intervention aimed at building attention, focusing, and inhibitory control in preschool kids in a classroom setting. And I raised this study because of the findings that they have in this test of an intervention are really interesting. They conducted the study in what might be considered an ideal situation to test the effects of income. That is, it's a classroom, a preschool classroom, on the Oregon State University campus. And half the children in the, in the classroom are children of the faculty and staff at Oregon State University. The other half the kids are Head Start kids, kids who are considered in poverty or near poverty and, um, in po and um, qualify for early Head Start services. So the classroom setting is the highest quality and standardized across these two income groups. One of the challenges in testing the effects of income on kids is that there's often disparities in the um, classroom context as well. So this standardized that. Here are the results of their study. And they're both encouraging and discouraging. If you look at this blue dashed line, those are kids not in Head Start, so middle and upper, upper income kids, who did not get the intervention. That maps on directly to that trajectory or the development of effortful control that I talked about in the preschool period. This dark blue line, or solid blue line, are the kids who are in middle and upper income families who got the intervention. So we can show that we can improve effortful control through a classroom-based intervention. That's exciting. The brown line and the gold line are the Head Start kids. And right off the bat, you can see they start and finish the year, or don't start, but finish the year lower in effortful control compared to the other kids. Now, the intervention did indeed improve their effortful control. The kids who got the intervention, that's the brown line, are better off at the end of the year than the kids uh, um, who didn't get the intervention. But we can see that they are significantly lower than the other kids, the middle and upper income kids. So while a classroom-based intervention in this case did increase effortful control, for kids who are growing up in a low-income setting, that might not be enough, that we might need to take into account the other half of the equation of poverty, and that's the family and parenting. So I want to say a little bit about implications of these findings for intervention and policy. And I'm going to touch a little bit on focusing on children, um, taking a developmental approach, and then focusing on parents and families. 
when we think about intervening with children, we want to consider programs that integrate these various indicators of children's well-being as they are interdependent. And it would be hard to promote one area of well-being without considering the other. So um, the integration of systems needs to be taken into account. Also that children are developing in a context, and we have to take that family context and parenting context and school and community context into account. The results of the um, Tomini and McClellan study but, and other studies suggest that what we really want to do is identify the children who are um, in greatest need in these high risk contexts who are likely to have disruptions in these key neurodevelopmental, neurophysiological systems and target intensive interventions, school-based and family-based interventions on, for those kids. It'll take both. When we think, take a developmental approach, I think it's important to think about tuning the target of intervention with the developmental period. So we um, want to take into account the important skills that are developing at different periods. And for targeting effortful control and stress regulation systems, it appears that we need to look in, in early childhood and in, in this preschool period. Um, so it may be a window of opportunity to improve children's effortful control. But keeping in mind that the same forces that divert their effortful control early in childhood are likely to divert the development of other things like problem solving and coping that are developing pre-adolescence. And then focusing on parent and families. Just a reminder about half the effects of poverty are accounted for by things in the home. And so it appears that parenting interventions are critical when we're talking about intervening with young children. We may need to address other issues in the family like health and nutrition and maybe parental health, mental health issues to um, also facilitate and support parents in these high risk settings. And the ideal may be to integrate parent and family support services with school based programs to get children on track when they start school and keep them on track um, academically and socially and emotionally. So I want to just acknowledge some of the sources of funding for this research that come from the federal government and from local sources, um, colleagues that help me think about my research, Mark Greenberg and Phil Fisher, who's here tonight, and um, my development lab at home, the <laughs> real inspiration and sources of many of my hypotheses about child development. And I welcome questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, for that, that great talk. I have, um, while people are going to the mics, I just had a real one quick question. Um, you were talking about the, the um, changes in cortisol, dis the cortisol dysregulation. Does anybody ever look at the sleep patterns of the kids in low income? Because that by itself can also lead to these disruptions in the circadian rhythms. I'm just That's a great question. I don't think there's a lot of attention to sleep patterns, but okay. we are measuring them, and we um, hope oh, to account great. for them. We're not measuring it directly, but we ask parents to tell us about their children's quality of sleep and their okay. pattern of sleep, and hopefully we can better understand how that plays a role. We do have our um, project talks about one child who we call, what do we call them, the nocturnal child, who actually has a reversed sleep cycle. Sleep, They're yeah. awake during the night and sleep during the day, maybe because of their family activities. And we don't know yeah. what we're going to do with their cortisol. We actually have to think pretty carefully how to include their cortisol data in our study. Yeah, great, thanks. OK, we'll take one question over there. Yeah, I was wondering to what extent you've looked at uh, the relationship between language development and the development of effortful control and how correlated those are, those associations. That's a great question, and they are correlated. Um, language skills seem to facilitate self-regulation. They certainly facilitate emotion regulation. Um, and we tend, when we're looking at the effects of effortful control, we're often controlling for language development and. Um, and intellectual ability more to just make sure we're looking at effortful control and not some of the other skills. But these um, um, definitely develop um, in, in concert with each other. And as language develops, we see kids' effortful control improving. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Another question behind me? Have you been able to distinguish effortful, effortful control? It's hard to say. It's effortful to say it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and a child who internalizes any kind of emotional response? There is some, some people who say that the higher, kids who are very high in effortful control um, are also more likely to internalize um, their responses and develop anxiety and depression and internalizing problems, problems where they've not expressed their emotions. 
I actually don't think that's happening. I think what's happening is there's a bit of a confound with how we measure it and how we see kids' emotional responses. So anxious kids um, early in childhood look good on these effortful control tasks because they don't dive in and do the thing we're asking them to do. They take a long time to do it. But as children develop, what we see is the opposite. Hi children higher in effortful control have lower anxiety and depression problems. And the reason is they tend to overcome their fears or motivation to avoid things. They tend to make themselves do things even when they don't want to or even when they're afraid. So they're overcoming some of those um, challenging emotions, but not putting them away or suppressing them, um, if that's what you meant by your question. I, I was actually thinking about the um, internalizing a, as a hard way to grasp what's really going on in the child that appears to be controlling. Tell me more what you mean. I'm not sure I get that. All right. Um, I have a daughter who was adopted, and, um, and I could tell after a while that she was very, very upset when she would get very quiet. Nobody else thought she was anything but being the good, studious kid whether it's preschool or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been a pattern that still continues. She's almost, well, she's 16, and, and still her first response is to total, totally internalize and not react right. at all. So when we, uh, and yeah, thank you for that clarification. So indeed not, that the children who are higher in effortful control are um, titrating their emotional expression to match a situation, and in that case, um, it takes, um, it, kids with higher effort control are more likely to overcome their impulse to not share their emotions. They're more likely to um, think through what is the right thing to do in the situation and share with that. So it's, um, it seems like that would be the case, but it's not about over control. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think, I think the gentleman was next and then we'll come back over here. I spent a number of years studying maternal and child health. And it seems to me that there's some early risk factors that you may not have covered. Mm -hmm. Single mothers, for instance, were more apt to have had a birth while, while a teenager. Right. And to have reduced educational attainment. Birth weight is related to IQ. Birth weight is related to socioeconomic status. SIB ship size is related to IQ, and SIB ship size is related to socioeconomic status, and IQ is related to birth order. Were you able to study any of these interactions? You raise really good points. In fact, in, when we study cumulative risk, we do include some of those risk factors that you named. So teen parenthood is usually in, included in our risk factors. I didn't show them here. Um, in part because they didn't <coughs> contribute to the development of effort control as we were studying it here. But we do measure some of those and we have included them when we think of cumulative risk as this accumulation of strain or stress in the environment and teen parenthood, um, low maternal education, um, some of those are included in what we've done before. Um, and our new study also is accounting for birth weight now. So we'll be able to answer those questions more carefully um, as we also um, look at this larger sample that we're collecting data on. Thanks for raising those, those are great. Okay, we'll take one question over on this side. Hi, um, is there a way that nature and nurture can be separated? Um, I imagine that parents who are in poverty are probably less likely to have high effort, effortful control themselves. Is there a way that that could be inherited and not just socially learned? Absolutely, it's a great question also. Um, it's hard to disentangle because their lower self-regulation in the parents may also have been from their socialization or from a genetic source. So um, in many of our studies where we, in the future and continue to look at the parents' self-regulation where they're at now, we can't, we don't do genetic studies and so we're not t disentangling which part is genetic and which part is social, but at least from the parents' contribution to the child's, we are kind of accounting for that. But um, I think some of those genetic studies would be really important too, to pursue. That's a great question, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Oh, did you have one more question? Yeah. 
Has your team had the opportunity to go into the home and study effort, effortful control and the cortisol levels versus the child coming out of the home with the caretakers not around and they're in a class or they're in an environment where they might be learning whether it's language or you yeah. know, physical activity or something like that and looked at those differences? We um, have done different things. So in our pre-adolescent study, we went to the families' homes, and it was a great opportunity to also um, see the families in their context. Um, but it introduces a whole range of problems, like the cat running over the computer, or the phone ringing in the middle of one of our effortful control tasks, or the child next door coming over and asking to play. So. In some, con and there are times where we've done home um, visits, even in this study, and that is challenging. So in this case, we started in the preschool years wanting to have as much control in the environment that we're looking at to look at the development of effortful control. In all likelihood, by the time we get to the follow-up of these kids, which I hope we do when we study these same kids in middle childhood, we'll probably go to their homes because then we do begin to see a greater impact of the broader environment, the neighborhood and the home context in other ways, and the community. And we have opportunities to observe and rate their communities that way. So we've done both. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.